Okay, hello everyone. Um, welcome, welcome to our, um, our webinar today about our new report, Housing Justice is the Cure, Eviction in Boston's Communities of Color During COVID-19. Um, just really want to appreciate everyone who has signed up and participated today, uh, everyone who's, who's joining us um, from Boston and elsewhere. Um, we, uh, we have gotten a lot of um, attention and interest in today's webinar and report um, from many people. So just a, a big, uh, um, you know, word of appreciation to everyone who's with us today. Um, I want to make a few housekeeping announcements. Um, I'm Home Fries. I'm the uh, communications director at City Life Theater Urbana, and um, we uh, are holding this webinar today uh, in the spirit of language justice with an interpreter. Um, and so we want to make sure that everyone um, is selecting a language in this webinar. Um, based on your preference between either English or Spanish. So if you're bilingual and you speak both English and Spanish, you can just choose whichever language you prefer. Um, but everyone should uh, select a language to hear the full webinar. So what you need to do is go uh, down to the um, menu in the bottom bar of your screen and you'll see a little globe icon um, in the bottom right corner. You should select either English or Spanish. Um, again, everyone on this webinar should select either English or Spanish so that you can hear the entire webinar today. So I'm just gonna give folks um, a few seconds to do that. Again, it's the, the globe icon um, in the bottom bar of your screen on the right-hand side. Okay, perfect. So this webinar will last about an hour. Um, and the focus of today's event is a new report by City Life Vita Urbana in collaboration with a researcher from MIT's Department of Urban Studies and Planning, Ben Walker. The report is called Housing Justice is the Cure, Evictions in Boston's Communities of Color During COVID-19. And we released this report to the world this morning and you can download it for free at covidevictions.org. And I'm gonna go ahead and put that in the chat. Um, covidevictions.org. Okay, great, thank you, Mike. So um, you can also download just the executive summary of the report there if you'd prefer. Um, it's a free report and we encourage you uh, to help spread the word about it uh, by sharing that link and also sharing the report's hashtag on social media, which is Boston COVID evictions. Oops, sorry, typo there. Um, so please help us spread the word about this report. And um, uh, I just wanna say uh, by way of introduction, um, that evictions are violent, devastating, and dangerous in our communities. Um, but nonetheless, well over 3,000 evictions have been filed in Boston during the pandemic, and over 20,000 evictions have been filed in Massachusetts during the pandemic. So today in this webinar, we're going to hear a breakdown of eviction patterns in Boston, um, looking at extreme racial disparities in eviction filing rates during the COVID-19 pandemic. And we're also going to talk about the widespread grassroots organizing to keep our homes um, in this public health crisis uh, and um, the, house, the, the work that housing justice organizers have done um, to build solidarity and collective action in this time. Uh, we have some amazing panelists. Um, I want to say, I believe, I believe all mothers, um, or at least several very amazing mothers um, on our panel today. We have Arlise Porcher, who's here with us from Georgetown Homes. Uh, we have Anna Fajardo, 
who is here with us from East Boston. And we have City Life's organizer, Francis Amador, uh, who is here with us again from City Life Theater Urbana. Uh, but we're gonna kick off this panel with um, a, a breakdown of the report's findings from Ben Walker, who is the, um, the, the lead researcher on this report and a recent graduate of MIT's Department of Urban Studies and Planning. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Ben and thank you everyone. Thank you, Home Price. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, there are many of you on the call that I know, and I just wanna take this opportunity to thank City Life for the opportunity to produce this report um, and uh, to thank those of you on the call who helped in the report's creation. Um, so I'm excited to share the product of many months of research with you today. Um, next slide, please. Um, and in the next few minutes, I'm going to introduce the key themes, uh, narrative framing and findings of the report. Uh, it's not a comprehensive overview of what we discuss in, in the full uh, 40 page report, but um, just a taste. Um, so I, I think the central framing of the report is that um, COVID's made it very clear that, that black and brown people need and deserve dignified housing that supports collective flourishing. Next, please. But more than 18 months since the pandemic began, uh, black and brown tenants in Boston face enduring challenges to housing and health. Next, please. Uh, as of uh, August 20th, 2021, um, there are uh, 115,000 renter households still behind on rent in Massachusetts, uh, and nearly three in four of these households identify as people of color. Uh, in Boston in particular, there are 14,000 renter households still behind on rent, owing an estimated uh, $47.7 million in, in back rent. Um, next slide, please. Uh, COVID-19 staggering repercussions for tenants of color, uh, as indicated by uh, these data and others, um, are the predictable outcomes of, of racial hierarchy. Next, please. So the focus of this report is to demonstrate how state strategies to manage pandemic transmission through housing access specifically failed Boston communities of color um, and black people in particular. Next, please. Without a vaccine, we know that reliable housing became a critical tool to mitigate COVID transmission and mortality. Next, please. Yet public health, health tactics triggered an uneven economic collapse that affected community, communities of color especially. Um, and this undermined housing stability for tens of color in Boston. Next, please. Now, by withdrawing emergency protections, um, such as the statewide eviction moratorium, um, legislatures further jeopardized tenant health and safety. Evictions continued, but so did COVID-19. Next, please. And this is, again, a, a predictable outcome of systemic racism, which positioned black and brown tenants to experience the worst of COVID's impacts on housing stability. Next, please. We were all told to stay home, yet generations of white supremacist housing policy sabotaged dignified housing in black, brown, and immigrant communities um, through programs like redlining, uh, and more recently uh, in, during the 2008 uh, housing crisis. Next, please. In City Life's previous report released um, in the early days of the pandemic, um, we see that eviction patterns offer one example of uh, how structural racism patterns uh, the way that we shelter our communities. Um, and this report found that from 2014 to 2016, 78% of all eviction filings occurred in communities of color in Boston. Uh, and 40% of evictions occurred in black communities in particular. Uh, finally, the, the third key finding in the report was that race is the strongest predictor of where evictions occur in Boston over and above uh, indicators of poverty. Um, next, please. Now, we know that evictions are always dangerous uh, with an array of damaging consequences for renters, um, ranging from uh, depression, uh, physical uh, effects to physical health, uh, and um, contributing to restricting access to future housing um, through the creation of tenant blacklists uh, that uh, rely on uh, records of eviction. 
Now, in a pandemic, evictions pose significant additional risks to health and stability. Next, please. Research in 44 states found that uh, states that lifted eviction moratoriums in the first six months of the pandemic had roughly double the COVID-19 incidence and five times the COVID-19 mortality than in states that kept protections in place. Next, please. So we wanted to look at these patterns um, in Boston specifically um, using eviction filing records from the pandemic's first year to see whether there was a relationship between race, uh, eviction patterns, and uh, COVID-19 infection. Um, next, please. Um, so the first of our findings is that uh, during the first year of the pandemic, Boston's communities of color were the brunt of the COVID-19 eviction crisis. Next, please. We found that 70%, uh, seven in every 10 uh, Boston eviction filings occurred in census tracts where the majority of renters are people of color, even though less than half of all Boston rental housing is located in these neighborhoods. Um, more specifically, 64% of all eviction filings occurred uh, in Roxbury, Dorchester, Mattapan, and Hyde Park, neighborhoods where the majority of residents are people of color, even though only 40% of all renter housing in Boston is located in these neighborhoods. The map on the right indicates these patterns. Um, the, the black and gray spaces, uh, which underlay uh, the, uh, the orange dots, uh, indicate the percentage of um, rent, uh, rent, renter households of color by census tract. Uh, so the darker the, the gray scale, uh, the, the higher the percentage of people of color living in any area. The orange dots represent um, the eviction filing rate. Um, so the larger the orange bubble, uh, the, the faster evictions occurred in each neighborhood. Um, next, please. Our second finding is that landlords aggressively pursued eviction against Black communities in particular. Um, next, please. So we found that 51% of all filings, more than one in two, occurred in census tracts with very high numbers of Black residents, even though these neighborhoods contain only 27% of all rental housing in Boston. Uh, and so what this means, uh, by, by a very high number of Black residents, what we mean is uh, the, we, we take the upper quartile of uh, census tracts uh, by the number of Black people in that census tract. Um, Within neighborhoods with extremely high concentrations of Black residents, the number of eviction filings was 6.5 times higher than in neighborhoods with extreme concentrations of white residents. The rate of eviction filing was nearly five times higher. Um, so in these tracts, uh, in the upper quartile of, of census tracts in Boston, um, 14 eviction filings occurred in every 1,000 occupied rental units, while in tracts with high concentrations of white residents, just three filings occurred for every 1,000 occupied rental units. Next, please. Our final finding uh, is that black and brown neighborhoods that experienced the highest eviction filing rates also experienced among the highest rates of COVID-19 infection. Next. As of March, 2021, Boston's black and brown neighborhoods experienced the highest uh, number of COVID, the highest count of COVID-19 infections, uh, especially in Dorchester and Boston and East Boston. Um, and combined, they experienced 39% of all COVID cases during the pandemic's first year, even though these neighborhoods account just uh, for 29% of Boston's total population. Now, when we combine eviction rates and COVID infection rates to compare, we see that the neighborhoods with high eviction rates and high COVID infection rates are Boston's predominantly black and brown neighborhoods, Roxbury, Dorchester, Mattapan, and Hyde Park. And we find that on average, landlords filed evictions at twice the rate in neighborhoods with the highest rates of COVID-19 incidents than in neighborhoods with the lowest uh, COVID-19 incidence rates. Next, please. So this chart indicates that relationship. As we move from left to right, um, we indicate that the percentage of people of color in each neighborhood increases. As we move uh, from bottom to top, we indicate that the rate of COVID incidence increases. Um, so uh, the, the bubbles furthest to the right and uh, closest to the top are neighborhoods with the highest uh, percentages of people of color 
and the highest rates of COVID-19 incidents. We indicate eviction filing rate by bubble size. So the, the larger the size of the orange bubble, the higher the eviction filing rate. Um, and so what this graphic indicates is um, an implied relationship between race, COVID incidents, and eviction filing. As the percentage of people of color increased um, in, in, in each neighborhood, we find, or the, the graphic indicates that um, COVID infection rates also increased uh, and eviction filing rates were also uh, especially high with some notable exceptions such as East Boston, which we can discuss in the question and answer section. Next slide, please. So Boston's concentration of race, illness, and forced expulsion is no accident, as we know. Next. We know that race is the strongest predictor of Boston evictions over and above indicators of poverty. Next. We know that eviction exposes communities to COVID-19 infection. Across the country, the more policymakers weaken projections, the more people fell ill. Next. The implication is clear. When politicians stripped away tenant protections, this choice exposed black and brown people to needless precarity, illness, and uh, potentially death. Next, please. Now, the pandemic is, as we know, far from over. Thousands of renters still sit on the edge of potential eviction, uh, a crisis deferred uh, through months of incremental policy, uh, as these policies are uh, let to expire or go underutilized. That's why to remedy COVID's lasting effects on black and brown tenants, Massachusetts lawmakers must swiftly expand and reinforce vigorous tenant protections that combat displacement. Next, please. Now, in the immediate term, there are three policies that can fill critical gaps in existing renter protections, and all are under consideration by the Massachusetts legislature via the COVID-19 housing equity bill. The first idea is to require rental assistance before eviction. Um, that is uh, to say that no eviction should occur when rental assistance applications are pending or available to eligible renters. Um, the second program is that no one should be evicted for rent debt uh, incurred during COVID-19. Um, through the state of emergency and lasting for a period of 12 months after the end of the state of emergency. And finally, um, we should pause no fault evictions. Um, so there should be no eviction without uh, just cause, such as rent non-payment, uh, through the state of emergency and for one year following. Next, please. Now, any long-term recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic must address the root problems responsible for COVID's disproportionate impacts on Black and Brown communities. Right now, um, City Life has consistently advocated for three policies that can stabilize housing, empower tenants, and support communities struggling against racial exploitation. The first is rent control um, to set affordable limits to annual rent um, increases each year. The second is um, pursuing tenant opportunities to purchase. Um, so giving tenants the power to take control of their homes by giving them the first chance to buy their building if it goes up to sale. Um, the finally, um, Boston and other cities across Massachusetts should consider just cause ordinances uh, to create permanent protections that prevent landlords from choosing to remove tenants for arbitrary or insubstantial reasons. Next, please. Now, we know that policy reforms aren't a silver bullet. This, the pandemic's effects will endure um, and the pandemic is ongoing. Um, so we also know it will take a real movement to uproot white supremacy and its deep legacy. But when thousands of black and brown people face profound threats to their lives, it's imperative to take immediate steps to keep people housed and to advance a powerful vision for shared flourishing. Next, please. Thank you so much. I'll turn it back to home price. Thank you so much, Ben. That was um, a really powerful breakdown of the report's findings. So I just wanna take a moment to announce again that uh, we have an interpreter on this webinar and uh, the webinar is in both English and Spanish. And so if you have joined recently, please make sure that you select a language, uh, your preferred language, either English or Spanish, um, by going down to the uh, bottom bar on your screen, looking for the little globe icon 
on the right hand side and clicking it and then you can select your preferred language. Um, everyone should select their preferred language in order to um, hear the entire webinar. Um, and I'm going to pause there so that that can be said in Spanish as well. Okay, I think that our uh, Spanish announcer is um, possibly having some tech difficulties. Oh no. Okay, um, Gabby, would you be able to say that? Hola a todos, buenas tardes. Um, solo un aviso de que este seminario se está interpretando en español. Por favor, busque el dibujo del globo del mundo uh, abajo de su pantalla o los tres puntitos que dicen más y escojan la uh, interpretación del lenguaje. Después escojan español y finalizado. Espero que se pueden conectar en español si están aquí para escuchar este seminario en español. Gracias. Thank you, Gabby. Um, so I just want to quickly say, you know, what we heard just now is that 70% of evictions filed in Boston during the first year of the pandemic were in parts of town where most renters are folks of color. And over 50% of those filings were in predominantly black renter areas. Um, and we also heard that eviction filing rates were two times higher in areas with the highest rates of COVID-19 infections compared with areas with the lowest rates of infection. Um, so really alarming findings uh, that we hope everyone will, uh, will sit with during and after this webinar. Um, our next two speakers have courageously fought to stay in their homes during the pandemic under the threat of eviction. They have fought both non-payment evictions and the threat of no-fault eviction. Um, no-fault evictions, by the way, were rampant prior to the pandemic in Boston's speculative housing market. And the pandemic hasn't stopped landlords from filing these types of needless evictions. Um, I'm gonna turn it now to our uh, guest, Arlise Porcher, a resident of uh, Georgetown Homes. Um, Georgetown Homes is an area where uh, we noticed that um, that mass evictions were being filed by uh, the landlord vegan communities. And it appears that vegan communities is still one of the top eviction filers in Boston during the pandemic. Um, so Arlise, um, thank you for being here today. We really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Uh, we know that your landlord vegan communities issued over a hundred eviction notices in your apartment complex uh, during the pandemic um, this past March. What kind of impact do you think that had on your community at Georgetown Homes? Um, well, it definitely had a negative impact. I did see a lot of people moving out. Um, a lot of us were struggling and suffering with anxiety, not understanding, because we could not get through to management to talk about our individual cases. Um, it was a lot. and. You know, thankfully, some of us were contacted by City Life and we were able to, you know, learn about each other because each of us thought it was just us going through it. So there was some sense of community there. So that was one positive aspect. But and we, had, we got stronger and we had a voice and we were able to fight and put Georgetown on notice in the media. And they were able to, you know, withdraw those court filings most of them, I believe, and um, they know they're being watched, so. Thank you. Um, how, I'm curious to know how you felt when you first received an eviction notice, um, you know, earlier this year, and what, what did you do? Um, for me, it was, I was a little confused because I'd paid the rent. I've been fortunate enough that I've been working through this whole pandemic. Um, so I didn't understand it. I tried to call the office. I was given a voicemail. Um, I couldn't get through to anyone. Then it happened again. It went on for like three or four months. So I kept getting these notices. 
I caught the um, constable as he was delivering and said, hey, I think you guys, this is a mistake. I've been trying to call. I got nowhere. Um, so it was really frustrating because no one would listen to you and you you can't even talk, argue your case and figure out what the heck is going on or say, is this a mistake? Like no one would talk to you. So it's just, it was really, really frustrating, nerve wracking, all of the above. And you're trying to maintain a household, maintain a job, take care of your children and you know stay safe. And you're dealing with this and you don't even know why. Yeah, um, that sounds extremely stressful <laughs> to say the least. Um, and you certainly responded uh, quickly, you know, um, with, you know, not just addressing your own problem, but also helping your neighbors address their problems too. Um, it seems that some large landlords have felt that filing an eviction is a way of pushing people to pay the money that they say is owed. What do you think that Beacon should have done differently um, instead of filing an eviction or filing evictions? Um, I feel like Beacon, there were several steps they should have taken before it got to that. You know, reach out to the person, reach out to the resident. Um, we were in the middle of a pandemic. Are people in the hospital? Are people sick? You know, what's going on? Why isn't this household paying or what is going on with their situation? Um, they have staff that they could have referred us to, to assist us. It could be language barriers. You don't know what's going on. And to work with us to get whatever assistance is out there before going that route. It just, it was unnecessary. Okay. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, no, it's just, you know, we're still going through it. It's a process, but you know, sometimes you do when you see those numbers that we just heard about. And you know, as a black person, you're fighting, you feel like you're constantly fighting, fighting for your job, fighting for your education. Now you're fighting to live in your home. And you feel de defeated, you feel beaten down, but you know, we can't, we got to keep going. Our ancestors fought too hard and too long, and we have to keep going. Thank you. Thank you for those uh, really powerful reflections and for sharing your story with us today. Thank you. Um, really incredible. Thank you so much, Arlise. Um, our next panelist is, um, is Anna Fajardo, who is joining us today from East Boston. Welcome, Anna. Yeah, my name is Anna Fajardo. Yo también fui impactada por el desalojo. A mí el señor de la casa aquí, nosotros no sabíamos por qué ni por qué él estaba mostrando la casa. Nosotros venimos con nuestros vecinos y dijimos que qué estaba pasando y él no nos quería dar una explicación, pero ya después, cuando él sintió que ya en la casa se podía poner a la venta, él dijo que teníamos que irnos salir, él nunca nos entregó una carta de desalojo y cuando nosotros le dijimos por qué, si nosotros nunca en pandemia y en todo le pagábamos la renta aunque nosotros miráramos cómo a veces dejábamos de pagar algo porque él no nos perdonaba ni cinco ni tres días de renta, él decía que él necesitaba el dinero de la renta fecha primero y yo le dije incluso que mi marido a veces no estaba trabajando y él me decía que era, no era su problema, él tenía que pagar su mortgage. Y yo le decía, pero tú puedes esperarlos unos dos, tres días. Él decía, no, él se ponía a gritar. Incluso él habla inglés, pero su esposa habla español. Él nunca nos traía a su esposa a tomarles una explicación. A él le gustaba que mi hija traduciera. Y mi hija le dijo un día, ¿por qué tú quieres sacarlos? Mi mamá tiene hijos, ¿cómo nos vamos a ir a la calle? Y le dijo que por qué no llegaba a un, a un arreglo con nosotros, con todos los, con los inquilinos, y decir si nos podía subir un poquito la renta, pero que no los desalojara del piso. Y digo, no, se tienen que ir. Entonces nosotros nos conectamos con City Light y ya ellos nos ayudaron a ir a protestas, manifestaciones, a muchas cosas nos han ayudado en todo. Nosotros nos comunicamos con ellos para cada cosa que pasaba aquí con él. Nosotros le llamábamos porque 
nosotros no teníamos cómo, cómo contactarlos con él ni nada y nosotros teníamos que llamarlos a ellos para que ellos hablaran con él lo que estaba pasando y sí, cuando vienen cuando venían los inspectores él venía a gritar que teníamos que abrir las puertas que todo nosotros le decíamos que también él tenía que avisar y él decía que para eso no había aviso y le dijo que sí para eso había aviso y él tenía que avisar él él supuestamente los trataba a nosotros como que él quería que ya no fuéramos y en esa pandemia cómo nos íbamos a salir nosotros con nuestros hijos a la calle y por eso Sirila sí, está viendo a ver si nos ayuda a que, que compren este bilde para que nosotros no podamos salir a la calle a, con nuestros hijos. Todavía no se sabe, pero en eso nos están ayudando. Ok, thank you, Ana. Um, so, Ana, that, that's a really powerful words you just shared with us about um, both experiencing the threat of eviction from your landlord um you know it, basically no fault eviction right because um he felt he could make more money by selling the property and you organized with your neighbors um and now um you're pursuing um the sale of your building to a nonprofit organization who can keep it affordable for the long run so that you can stay there um so i just have one question for you um we don't have a lot of time but um do you think that uniting with your neighbors has been an important part of stopping your uh, potential eviction? Do you think that solidarity with your neighbors has been an important part of this? Sí, porque unidos todo lo podemos hacer. Si nos unimos, podemos salir adelante y luchar contra ese desalojo. Okay, um, well, thank you so much for joining us today, Anna. Um, I'm sorry we're short on time, but those were, um, those were really helpful stories that you shared about organizing to stay in your home um, and standing up for your rights. When your landlord threatened to evict you, you didn't just um, take it, you decided to, uh, to take action to stay in your home with your neighbors. So um, very powerful. Thank you again. And we're going to turn it over now to Francis Amador, who is a uh, organizer with City Life Theater of Ana, also an East Boston resident. And um, Francis, um, it would be really great to hear from you today a little bit about what it's been like to organize to stop evictions in a pandemic. This is a really um, unique experience that you've had in over the past year and a half. What are some of the main impacts? Um, well, actually, first, let me say, you've been uh, fielding a lot of hotline calls overseeing the Spanish uh, language side of our hotline at City Life. Um, and so you've been talking to a lot of people um, experiencing or threatened with eviction lately. What are some of the main impacts or consequences of an eviction on a family as you see it? Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, devastating uh, instability when uh, we see when our tenants get noticed to quit, we see them, they're emotional, they're getting stable, they're wary, especially if they have kids. Kids worry more than um, sometimes in parents. Kids are very wary about um, moving out uh, from what they call home moving out because they're feeling like, oh, I'm not gonna go to the school anymore. I'm gonna lose my friends. Um, they get very wary as well. Um, and families get in a stable, emotional, and very wary about it. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm curious to know about your experiences organizing actions, rallies, protests, you know, vigils, marches during the pandemic. Um, what is the most memorable uh, direct action that you've helped organize during the pandemic? I think that my most memorable action, um, it was the first action that we had during the pandemic. It was a caravan action. Um, it was one of the most memorable because we didn't know how to 
how to um, organize an action during this pandemic. No one, nobody want to get sick and we didn't want to get anyone else to get sick. So we are, organized this caravan um, rally, which was, we went like from many, many cities. I remember like we start from many cities that we were seeing uh, tenants getting impacted by um, eviction. Okay, thank you. Um, we're going to actually take a second to show a few photos um, from some of City Life's uh, direct actions during the pandemic. Um, so we're just going to show a few of those. Um, and while that's getting queued up, um, there's one other question I have for you, Francis. Um, so as you said, evictions are, are devastating and dangerous, um, but they continue to happen uh, during COVID-19, um, especially as we've heard in Boston's communities of color. What do you think is the way forward out of this crisis? I think the way forward out of this crisis is to organize, don't move, um, fight for your house, fight for your rights, know your rights. And also I think um, we need a law that will put to protect us, right? During this pandemic and after this pandemic because we're in the middle of the pandemic. Um, so I believe that the best way is organize and the housing um, equity bill will protect us and will protect our tenants as well from this um, devastating pandemic of eviction. Okay, thank you. Um, and we will put a link in the chat uh, for folks who want to learn more about the COVID housing equity bill that Francis just mentioned. This is a piece of legislation that we discuss in the report and that our statewide coalition, Homes for All Massachusetts, um, has been pushing for, 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 uh, th for throughout much of the pandemic um, as a comprehensive solution to stopping all of these needless evictions. So we'll put a link in the chat there soon. Um, so for now, we're actually going to open it up to uh, questions and answers uh, from folks in our uh, in in our um, in attendance on this webinar. And um, for some reason, I'm not able to see the chat right now. Unfortunately, <laughs> uh, maybe if you stop sharing those photos, that would that would help. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, we see one, thank you everyone for uh, bearing with us. Uh, we have one uh, question in the chat here from um, Kavish Gandhi, who is curious about uh, Chinatown residents. So um, where is Chinatown in this graph of neighborhoods? Um, how do you disentangle or entangle race and poverty slash class in the analysis across neighborhoods. Um, and Kavish says, I, says, I imagine uh, both play a significant role um, and tangled role in this issue. Uh, how would you respond to that, Ben? Sure, let me take the second question first, um, which was answered by City Life's previous report um, written by David Robinson, a colleague from MIT. Um, in that report, we found that um, race was the strongest uh, predictor of eviction over and above other common indicators of poverty. Um, and to narrow the analysis, um, uh, the report looked specifically at evictions that occurred in market rate housing uh, and found that of those evictions, 70% also occurred in communities of color. Um, so for, from City Life's perspective, um, that analysis answered uh, questions that we had about the relationship between race and, and eviction and um, class um, that over and above, uh, of course, you know, poverty and class play significant roles in housing security. Um, but it seemed like um, race was the strongest feature um, uh, amongst uh, a related web of factors. Um, as to your question about Chinatown, um, there are two answers. Um, two related answers. 
Um, the first is um, about the method that we use to produce the report. Um, to produce an analysis uh, re relating race, eviction, and COVID-19, we relied on neighborhood geographies used by the Boston Public Health Commission um, in their public data about COVID incidents and mortality. Um, everyone likes to divide Boston neighborhoods in their own way. Um, the Boston Public Health Commission used um, an aggregated neighborhood that they called downtown, which included Chinatown, um, Beacon Hill, and Back Bay. Um, so it obscures a, a closer analysis of Chinatown, um, which I think is absolutely necessary uh, and important moving forward um, for a second related reason, which is that um, in Boston, immigrant communities from Asia, Latin America, and the Caribbean may be especially at risk of evictions without legal process. And uh, we discussed this in City Life's previous report. Um, so in a survey of renters in Boston's Chinatown, four of, out of every 10 respondents say that they didn't have a formal lease, uh, and nearly eight out of 10 said that they didn't know where to access information about their rights as tenants. Um, and of those in uh, this Chinatown survey who faced an eviction, um, nearly six out of 10, uh, 59%, reported that the property owner or manager served the notice of eviction verbally, which does not comply with state law and leaves no formal record of eviction. Um, so our report relies on formal records of eviction filing in housing court. Uh, and this is just, in, in reality, a, a slim fraction of the total number uh, of uh, forced moves and, and expulsions that occur uh, in any time, um, and especially in a pandemic. Um, so this produced, I think, a notable outlier in the case of East Boston, where we know from our organizers and from our tenant leaders um, uh, that, that tenants are experiencing uh, constant threat of eviction, yet um, this often doesn't surface in housing court because of informal housing arrangements and uh, landlords pursuing, frankly, um, illegal evictions. Uh, they're breaking the law uh, because um, tenants are vulnerable in, in ways uh, particular to immigrant communities. Um, so I hope that answers your question. There was also a related question about Chinatown in the Q&A. Um, thank you. Thank you, Ben. Um, it is very important to understand that the, that the totality of displacement is much larger than the number of evictions uh, that we can understand through housing court data. So there are far, far more um, Boston residents that um, experience displacement um, often under the threat of eviction, uh, but, but don't wind up fighting it in court and therefore we don't have uh, data on that. Um, always a really important thing to keep in mind. Um, and I just wanted to highlight a comment in the chat from uh, Noemi Rodriguez. Um, Noemi, would you like to share your comment um, verbally? I believe we can allow you to unmute if you'd like to. I think um, uh, gracias, oh. gracias por darme esa oportunidad. Eh, esto es algo que está impactando, verdad, no solamente a familias nuevas, sino que a familias que venimos luchando desde hace mucho tiempo atrás. Y algo indignante es que sabiendo, verdad, un sistema tan racista, tan malo, que nosotros somos los más vulnerables a este impacto tan negativo de la pandemia pero también ellos son parte y tienen culpa de todo lo que nosotros estamos viviendo, porque ellos no crean planes que puedan servir para nosotros o que puedan ayudar para sobrevivir. De una u otra forma, ellos también son parte de estos planes para nosotros ser desplazados, ya que sabemos que la gentrificación en nuestra comunidad está afectando gravemente a muchas de las familias e impactando a muchos niños que estudian dentro de las escuelas públicas. Esto es indignante y también es injusto cuando sabemos que muchas verdad de las familias que han sido afectadas, que han quedado con daños, con problemas de salud, nadie está reconociendo lo que han vivido. Nadie está respondiendo a decir y tener dignidad de tener un seguro médico que los pueda también respaldar. Todo esto es un impacto tan negativo 
en las comunidades de colores como es la de nosotros, East Boston. Y por eso nosotros seguimos luchando y seguimos apoyando a muchas de las familias que no conocen sus derechos, porque esto es injusto y un sistema debería de estar preparado para responder ante la emergencia de cualquier situación. Y yo creo que es injusto e indignante que en una nación unida no puedan haber recursos para las personas que vienen a trabajar y a luchar y a levantar una economía. Yo puedo mirar que esto es completamente injusto e intolerable. Yo soy un inmigrante más de este país, pero he venido a luchar, a trabajar y a decir basta a las injusticias. Y creo que vamos a estar siempre trabajando de la mano con los compañeros y amigos dentro de nuestra comunidad. Gracias. Thank you so much, Noemi, for all of your reflections on dignity and justice and, and solidarity in these times. Uh, that was much appreciated. Um, I want to turn now to a question uh, from Julia Healy, who's asking, um, now that the acting Boston mayor has implemented a COVID-19 eviction moratorium, are there any policy actions that the mayor can do right now to address this issue? Um, and Ben, do you have any reflections on that? Yes, I do, Home Price. Um, thank you for your question. I think, first of all, any piece of legislation that keeps tenants housed in an unprecedented global pandemic is a good thing. We want people to stay in their homes. Um, but I think it's important uh, to look at what the Boston eviction moratorium is um, and what it is not. Uh, and it is not a holistic plan to prevent displacement um, during COVID-19 and in the recovery period uh, afterward. Um, it only applies to the levying eviction um, at the end of a multi-stage legal process that uh, over the course of the process, it intimidates tenants into leaving um, before a, a final execution from the judge. Um, So there's far more work to do to keep everyone housed. And um, the policies that we outlined in this report um, uh, can and should be adopted um, by um, Mayor Janney now and uh, whichever Mayor Boston has in the future, including rent control, including tenant opportunity of purchase, and, and including uh, passing a just cause ordinance uh, that blocks unnecessary eviction. Um, So I'll leave it at that, home price, if you wanted to add anything. Uh, you know, I would just add that, you know, our, uh, our organization, City Life Vida Urbana, and um, in, you know, solidarity with similar grassroots organizations uh, led by frontline residents across the state is continuing to push for the COVID housing equity bill, because we know that uh, that is really the only way to ensure that needless evictions and foreclosures uh, don't continue throughout, uh, throughout this extremely dangerous time. Um, so, um, you know, the, the, the Boston moratorium is a good step, but it's certainly not, as you said, part of a comprehensive anti-displacement uh, uh, plan. Um, I, I mean, it's not, it is not in itself that plan. So I'm going to turn now to um, a question, actually these two questions from both Steve Meacham and Kavsh Gandhi kind of go hand in hand. Uh, they're both about um, informal evictions or evictions that um, don't go through the formal uh, court process. Um, Steve is asking, could you explain more about how the eviction statistics don't reflect the real number of no-fault evictions um, that don't necessarily go through court? And, and Kavish is asking, are there ways that you're thinking of continuing to look at informal evictions, you know, um, through surveys or some other sort of mechanism to understand it better? Sure, so I'll start with Steve's question. Um, so a no fault eviction is when a landlord evicts a tenant uh, through no fault of the tenant's own. Um, so the tenants paid rent, uh, there's no issue, uh, but the landlord wants them out of the building. And often this occurs when um, the, the property owner wants to redevelop a unit uh, or renovate or have you know, someone else move in. Um, so they can do this by 
for example, refusing to uh, renew uh, the tenant's lease, uh, which isn't a, a formal eviction that you would file in housing court, um, but a, a, rather another way of forcibly expelling a tenant from housing um, for arbitrary reasons. Um, and this is uh, unfortunately an outcome of our market-based system of um, housing, which conditions access to housing on uh, individual property owners. Um, so evictions such as, such as uh, the ones I've described don't occur, don't surface in housing court as, uh, on the formal record uh, in the way that other kinds of informal evictions also don't surface in housing court as part of the formal record. Um, and uh, as I noted, this is um, an extreme concern for organizations like City Life, um, which, which deal with informal evictions all the time. Um, and it's a, a pressing concern for researchers. Um, what we know about informal or illegal evictions is very limited and mostly comes from Matthew Desmond's um, Milwaukee study of eviction. Um, and the, the one example of Milwaukee has been generalized to um, discuss the phenomenon nationwide, even though um, even within Boston, there are variations in the reasons why people are kicked out of their housing across neighborhoods. Um, the difference between East Boston and Chinatown, for example, um, different tactics, different kinds of landlords uh, and different outcomes. Um, so I think um, future research is needed. Um, and hopefully it's something that City Life can pick up in the future. Okay, thank you. Um, and we only have a few minutes left, but I wanna definitely take this um, question from Avery, uh, Avery in the chat who, um, who's with the, the Bay State Banner. Um, when looking at, relation, at the relationship between evictions and higher COVID-19 rates by neighborhood, how do you assess or incorporate other factors that might be pertinent outside of housing specific issues that raise infection numbers? Yeah. So this is a question about that overlap between mm -hmm. evictions and COVID rates. Thank you, Avery. Uh, it's an important question um, and it's not addressed in the report. The reason why it's not addressed in the report is because we are working with limited data um, with um, constraints that I've already described. Um, a lot of the COVID data we had access to was um, generalized. Um, a lot of the, the number of eviction uh, filings we had data for was limited. Um, and we felt that we did not yet have enough information at the time of analysis to produce um, something solid. So what the report offers is um, a description of uh, geographic overlap between race, eviction, and COVID-19. Um, these findings are suggestive um, and, as I said, descriptive. Um, so I think it's the job of future research, future analysis, to um, identify strong correlations between race, eviction, and COVID in Boston. Um, we felt that we had to fill um, a critical gap in identifying um, basic geographic overlap. Um, and I think we've done so. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that question, Avery. And um, as Ben said, we, you know, the report shows the geographic overlap between eviction rates and COVID infection rates. Um, not necessarily saying there's, you know, the, the report isn't speaking directly to the cause effect relationship there, but noting that that overlap does exist um, in, you know, in clear ways in, uh, in parts of Boston. So um, I just want to wrap this up by saying everyone should go to covidevictions.org, download the report, um, spread the word, uh, the link and the hashtag Boston COVID evictions um, on your social media accounts and to your friends and family. Uh, we are um, sounding the alarm about how uh, evictions are rampant during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, despite being uh, violent, dangerous, and devastating to our communities. 
Uh, and we are calling for bold, immediate interventions, uh, specifically in the form of the COVID-19 housing equity bill to ensure that all of these needless evictions um, stop immediately across the state. So um, I just wanna thank everybody for joining us today, for, for listening, for tuning in to all the details, uh, for sharing your thoughts and perspectives and your stories. Um, and um, just wanna give a round of applause to our panelists. Thank you so much for being with us. And if you, um, have any uh, questions or comments, you can um, go to the contact tab on that website, covidevictions.org, get in touch with us. We're happy to um, elaborate on this. Uh, if you're a reporter, we're happy to put you in touch with folks to interview. All right, thank you very much, everybody. This has been a really wonderful, really appreciate your presence here.